coming up on this extended episode of Photography Online. We attempt an ambitious photo, again. We show you how to get creative with camera movement. And we visit a community darkroom and make a print. After an extended summer break, we are back with an extended show to make up for deserting you for so long. Welcome to another episode of Photography Online and welcome to the Scottish summer. In addition to everything you've just seen, we also have an amazing giveaway for you. Over £1,000 worth of camera batteries, so make sure you hang around. Before all of that though, here is a quick photography question just for fun. Which of these combinations would give the greatest magnification when viewed at 100% on a computer? A, a 200mm lens on a full frame camera. B, a 200mm lens on a micro four thirds camera. C, a 200mm lens on an APS, a crop sensor camera or D, it makes no difference as it's to do with the pixel density, not the sensor size. I'll give you the answer later in the show. Now, if you are a regular viewer of the show, you might remember last November we documented Marcus's annual attempt to get a specific photo from one of the least accessible places on the planet, a remote corner of the UK's remotest island of St Kilda. At that time, he wasn't successful, but we've just returned from running our annual trips there for 2022, one of which I tagged along on so he was able to give it another go. Lying 40 miles off the west coast of Scotland is one of its best kept secrets. St Kilda is a land like no other, an extinct volcano protruding from the wild North Atlantic seas. I get to visit once a year and if you were watching photography online last summer you would have seen me attempting to bag a specific photo I've been trying to get for a while now. The time has come again, so I'm hoping to capture the perfect shot of a scene few people will ever get to witness. But first, I need to get there. Welcome to the edge of the world, which, as you can see, is looking like the edge of the world. I'm just waiting for the light. It has happened very briefly, but not to the intensity that I want. So we do have a nice cloud covering the top of this island today, which is really good, because I've never got that before. Every time I've got good light here, I've always had clear skies. So I quite like the cloud. Um, so everything's looking good. It's semi clear to the east, um, although I can't see the sun from here. So um, I've no idea when and if it's going to happen without abandoning this location, which I don't really want to do because it's a bit scary getting here. Um, so the less times I have to do the uh, journey, the better. But I've got the camera set up to do a panoramic stitch because there's no way you can get this in one go. Um, it's literally 180 degrees side by side. Um, so the camera's all ready to go. I'm just waiting for the light and it could happen at any moment or it might not happen at all. If it doesn't happen at all, then it'd be another year because <clears throat> if you saw the previous feature about this location, I only really get one opportunity a year to do this. But this is the best it's, or, or the most promising it's ever looked um, in all the years that I've been coming here, which has probably been seven. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed and we'll see what happens. One of the main challenges with shooting at this location, other than the access, is the permanent swarm of birds. Fulmars, puffins, gannets and guillemots are in constant flight in every direction. And this movement drastically limits the exposure time I can shoot at. In these light levels, shooting at ISO 100 and F11 
will typically give an exposure time of around 1 30th of a second. But doing this ends up with lots of ghost birds everywhere. So the options are to go longer than two seconds, which totally eliminates all the moving birds, or go faster than 1 200th to freeze their movement. For me, the birds are part of the atmosphere, so I want to keep them in the scene, which means shooting at a higher ISO in order to achieve a short enough exposure time. So the light did just happen, but it was quite fleeting. And because I have to do probably seven or eight, maybe nine shots, and have to level the camera between each one, it takes me probably 30 seconds to do the full sweep. And um, the light was changing throughout that 30 seconds. So although I'm fairly confident I got the best of it when I was in the middle, it's just starting to come back again now. Um, I won't know until I look at all the photos. So I'm gonna wait and try and do another one, get a safety one in the, in the bag. But uh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna have to be very quick with my sweep. The light came good for just long enough that I was able to fire off a series of nine vertical images, all of them timed so that the birds weren't too close to the lens, as even at 1 200th of a second, they still blur when at close proximity. I used a 21 mm lens to give me the sufficient vertical coverage and bumped the ISO up to 400, as well as trading off a stop of aperture to give me the exposure time required to freeze the movement. I love the cloud over the island and the side light is exactly why I always come in the middle of the summer, as this wouldn't be achievable at other times of the year. I also like the light down here on the sea stacks. All in all, I'm happy with this shot which is 20,000 pixels wide. That means it will comfortably print at over two meters wide. So there we have it. At last, I got the light I wanted. The sky's good as well, so can't complain about that. Of course, it's not perfect, so still have to come back again next year, but that's the beauty of the challenge of photography is that you never cross that finish line. So I think it's all in the bag. All I've got to do now is start my two day journey to get back home. But at least I know I've got that on the memory card. Let's just hope it stitches together. That photo will soon be available to purchase as a print, but understandably, when a shot takes seven years to achieve and you need to put that much effort into getting to the location, it needs a special place in a gallery. Along with other photos which are truly unique, many of which are hand printed, Marcus will be launching something called the Legacy Gallery, which will showcase and sell the very best of his images, all limited edition. Some will be limited to only one, where others might be limited to 15. Now, it wouldn't be the kind of place to go to if you're looking for a bargain to put into an Ikea frame, but if you want something special to act as a talking point on your wall, then you'll know where to go. It's in the process of being set up and we'll be featuring it when it goes live, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, so we know that most of you watching will be digital shooters. This means that you'll need batteries for your camera, so this next feature will hopefully be of interest. Plus, we'll be giving away £1,000 worth of camera batteries in just a moment, so don't be going anywhere. When we buy a new camera, we typically get a branded battery included. But one battery isn't much use if we're planning on heading out for a day of photography and plan to take lots of photos, or even worse, video. So inevitably, we end up having to buy a couple more batteries to provide that peace of mind that we're not going to run out of power prematurely. This is where we are faced with a choice, to buy branded batteries or third-party batteries. Branded batteries always cost more, but they are good batteries and will last a long time before they start to fall off in performance. Third-party batteries are cheaper, and this is their appeal, but they do have a reputation of not lasting very long. So, is it a false economy? Before we go any further in the interests of honesty and integrity, 
This piece is being sponsored by Newell, a third party battery company. They approached us over a year ago to see if we'd like to review their batteries. And initially we said no. Third party batteries are great when they're brand new, but tend to degrade over time. But then we came up with an idea and went to them with a proposal. We said we'd be happy to put them through their paces for a year with our pro team charging them once or twice a week and to see how they put up with the endurance of being used day in, day out by professional photographers. Then, no matter what the results, we would air it here on the show. So, here we are a year later on, and we're about to find out. My personal advice to our workshop customers has always been to buy branded batteries. I've previously been tempted by the cheap prices of third-party batteries in the past, which has initially saved me lots of money. We're looking at about £100 for a branded Canon battery compared to about £30 for a third party battery. So the savings can be significant, especially if you're looking at buying two or three. At first, you think you've got a good deal, as all batteries are pretty good when new, but the cheapest batteries I bought started dropping off in performance after only a few charge cycles, and it wasn't long before they were virtually useless. If this is a familiar experience for you, then you'll know that at the end of the day, you end up buying the branded batteries and spend more money in total, having wasted your money on the cheap third party batteries. So when Newell reached out to us, we were understandably skeptical and certainly weren't prepared to endorse a product which we wouldn't use ourselves. Hence the agreement that we try their batteries exclusively for 12 months before coming to any conclusions. A good place to start then is a direct comparison between the branded Canon batteries and the Newell equivalent. For the latest Canon batteries, for the likes of my Canon R5, you're looking at spending about £110. For the Newell equivalent, however, you'll only be spending £49. So for the price of my Canon battery, I can get two Newell batteries and still have enough change left over for a photography online cleaning cloth and a sausage and egg McMuffin. But price isn't everything, as performance is also key to making any comparisons. So let's look at capacity power. The Canon battery is rated at 2,130 milliamps, and the Newell Plus battery is rated for 2,250 milliamps. This means it should deliver more power and last slightly longer. Not bad for half the price, but here's the crucial thing. How long do the batteries actually last? This is another key piece of information which you won't find stated on any box and it is the reason we only agreed to do this feature once we had a chance to put these batteries through a serious test. The whole Photography Online team have been using the new Newell Plus batteries as our main power source since they arrived at the end of last summer. We use them in our Canon R6 which is used to film most of the content you see on this channel and this has a habit of really eating up the power. We would typically get through eight batteries per show, as we also use them in our slider, so we're regularly exhausting them and recharging them. Both Nick and Marcus have been using them in their cameras too, so between us we feel like we've given them a pretty good workout. We're now in a position to deliver a valid and qualified verdict. We numbered all the batteries which were supplied to us and kept a record of how many charge cycles we put through each one. I have to admit, this has been difficult to do when away from home, as typically you lose count of which battery has been charged and which hasn't. But I reckon I've probably put about 40 charges through each battery, which probably represents more than a year's worth of use for the average photographer. Unlike other third-party batteries we've used in the past, we've noticed no drop-off in performance in the Newell Plus batteries at all. So it would seem as though these are a really good way to save money and get more performance to boot. Another aspect which we were impressed by are the Newell chargers. These have a mains charger which has an auxiliary USB output to enable you to charge another accessory such as your phone or an LED light. And they also have a super compact and lightweight USB charger which is ideal for travel. You can also select rapid or trickle charging options, the latter being in the best interests of the longevity of the battery. Since receiving the Newell Plus batteries a year ago, Newell have now released their new Supercell batteries, which have been optimised to work in extreme temperatures and harsh conditions. But seeing as we've only had them for a few weeks, and technically it's the Scottish summer, we've not been able to test them to their full extent, 
but if the plus batteries are anything to go by, then we've got every confidence that the more powerful Supracells will be even better. As I mentioned at the start of this feature, it is sponsored by Newell, but only on the agreement that we were free to report our findings, whatever they might be. As a working professional photographer, I'm often asked what recommendations on equipment that I have, and I'm only ever happy to give recommendations on stuff that I would personally use and spend my money on. With that in mind, I would be recommending the newer batteries to people simply because I'm happy spending my hard-earned cash on these batteries. So for anyone looking to save a bit of money, these are what you're looking for. Newell batteries come in Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fujifilm, Olympus, Panasonic and GoPro formats. Supracell come in Canon, Nikon, Panasonic and Sony, with others expected in the future. So although we've only had experience comparing them to the Canon batteries, we've got no reason to think that there would be any difference to any of the other brands. Newell are so confident of the longevity of their products that they all come with a standard 40-month warranty. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got an exciting giveaway over £1,000 worth of Newell batteries. Plus, we've got an exclusive 15% discount code for anyone else who wants to get their hands on some. We are looking for 10 winners, each of whom will receive £100 to spend on Newell products. All you have to do to be in with a chance of winning one is to go to the competition link, which is in the usual place below, and follow the simple instructions. Never say we don't look after you. And thank you to Newell for providing us with batteries to test and for the giveaway. All right, well, I reckon it's about time to go over some camera skills. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes get blurry images, which I had been led to believe were technically flawed, but apparently, if you call them art, you can get away with it. Here's Nick to explain. I'm guessing that up until now you have most likely rejected photographs which have come out blurry, as keeping the camera still is often our main objective as photographers, but sometimes introducing movement can be beneficial. There's a photographic technique aptly named Intentional Camera Movement, or ICM for short, whereby, yes you've guessed it, we intentionally move the camera during the exposure. The good thing about ICM is that it's something you can do on grey overcast days when normal photography might be proving a challenge, as the light levels will be lower, allowing us to use longer exposure times. Also, every time you press the shutter, you don't know what the resulting image is going to look like until the exposure has finished, so consider each shot as a bit of an experiment. This is, however, one of the interesting things about ICM, every shot will look different. I previously captured ICM images within Woodland and at the coast, however any subject could potentially produce a good ICM photograph, but ones with strong horizontal and vertical lines often work best. It's then simply a case of moving the camera in the direction of the lines, but more on that in a moment. You can pretty much use any focal length for ICM. At the coast, a wide angle lens will work to capture the sand on the beach, the sea and the sky, whereas in a woodland I find that longer focal lengths work better as I can hone in on certain groups of trees. With ICM, you can shoot handheld or from a tripod, using either the viewfinder to the eye or the camera's live view at arm's length. Personally, I prefer to use the viewfinder, but sometimes I switch to using the live view, because that's just the way I roll. The aperture you choose doesn't really matter, as of course the photograph is going to be blurry anyway, so depth of field isn't a concern. However, with ICM, we close the aperture down to reduce the amount of light coming through the lens, which will give us longer exposure times. Of course, if you can't get a long enough exposure time by closing the aperture all the way down, then you'll have to resort to using filters such as NDs. The main thing with ICM is exposure time. If this is too short, then moving your camera during the exposure will most likely result in a static photograph, and if it's too long, then this may result in an undesirable effect. 
basically there is no correct exposure time. It's simply finding the correct length which gives you the desired result. The longer the focal length and the faster you move the camera, the shorter the exposure time that you will need to get the desired result. The ISO you choose isn't really that important. However, I generally choose ISO 100, which is the lowest native setting on my camera, so it gives me the least amount of noise. I then use the aperture and filters to get the desired exposure time. Here in this woodland where my subject is vertical, I obviously need to move the camera up or down during the exposure. Whichever way I choose won't make any difference to the end result. The most important thing is to follow the direction of the subject. However, with ICM there's nothing to say you can't experiment by moving the camera sideways or in a circular motion to see what results you get. My advice would be to not try this with film unless you know exactly what works as you'll likely get through a lot of it and you won't be able to see your results to allow you to adjust accordingly. I'm going to start with an exposure time of half a second. So with my ISO set to 100, I now need to choose the aperture which gives me a good looking histogram at that exposure time. Composition is actually more important than you may think, as even though the image will be blurry, if we place a dominant tree in the middle of the frame, but don't have symmetry either side of it, it may look a bit safe and naive with the tree being in the middle. Therefore, we still need to consider our viewpoint and composition as if we were shooting a still image of the same scene. Here I found a nice grouping of trees, with a wider one a third of the way in from the left of the frame, which I think will work nicely in the final composition. Now I've got my settings dialed in and my composition sorted, I just need to figure out whether to move the camera up or down during the exposure. Most of the time I start low, as I know what I want at the bottom of the frame, which in this case is the green bracken and grasses which will give a nice contrast to the colour of the trees. One possible downside of doing this is that if my exposure time is too long, by the time I have stopped moving the camera upwards, I may have the brighter areas of the sky in the frame, and this quite often doesn't look good in the final image. Choosing my starting point, I now press the shutter halfway to focus in the middle of the frame. Where I focus doesn't need to be precise, as of course the image is going to be blurry anyway, I now continue to press the shutter the rest of the way whilst moving my camera upward until the photograph has been captured. I also need to make sure I don't move my camera side to side whilst moving it upwards, as this plane of movement will end up looking not so intentional and will therefore be CM rather than ICM. The speed you move the camera will also have an important bearing on the final image, so experiment with this. Here I move too slowly as the resulting image isn't blurry enough. So I'll take the photograph again, this time moving a bit faster. This one is much better and I feel that a half a second exposure time is perfect as I don't want to be moving the camera any further upwards. You could also experiment with a one second exposure but when you press the shutter button fully, hold the camera still momentarily before applying the movement. This will give a partial still image with ICM thrown into the mix. You can then vary this mix by delaying the time between the start of the exposure and the start of the movement. It's best to use a tripod for this technique, as you really want the first part to be as still as possible. Quite simply, with ICM, the possibilities are endless. Find a subject which you think will work. Experiment with exposure time and how you move the camera. But most importantly of all, get out there and have fun. So Nick's just shown us how to use camera movement creatively and on a similar theme he'll be back in our next show to tell us how to avoid unintentional camera movement so don't miss that. So believe it or not we are in the middle of the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere and I reckon you could do with a new t-shirt. Luckily we have these very nice ones from Photography Online with a logo on the front and the back and they come in any colour you like as long as it's white or grey. But we do also have a limited supply of these navy ones with our long shot logo on them and finally we have got this one which might be more appropriate it's our mid-tone crisis slogan. All of these are available from our shop while stocks last and we won't be getting new 
new stock in once these ones have been sold. So grab one out while the opportunity is there. They could be worth a fortune one day. All right, well, two and a half years ago when we launched Photography Online, one of the feature ideas we had was to highlight the existence of community darkrooms. These exist all over the country and indeed all over the world. So even if you're watching from outside the UK, there will probably be one not too far from where you live. Our local one is based in Inverness, but due to the pandemic, we've had to put this feature on hold for a while. It might be long overdue, but I was keen to make a visit and see how they work and more importantly, take the opportunity to print a couple of my photos. Once upon a time, it was common for photographers to have their own dark rooms in their homes, even if this was just a cupboard under the stairs. But in these modern digital days, few of us have such a facility. I wanted to get a couple of prints done of some photos I took on a trip to Blackpool, which we featured in this show. So I went along to my local community darkroom where I met up with one of the volunteers who run it, Matt Sillers, who I was hoping could show me, a total novice, how to complete an often uncompleted stage of the photographic process. Community darkrooms also offer an environment to develop film, but I had already done this at home, so it was just a case of selecting a couple of suitable frames. These two here, which you can't really mm -hmm. see, which yeah. have got some nice light leaks down the side. I say nice just because I'm trying to rescue what was something I did wrong. But yeah, but you, you work with serendipity. You know, if something weird happens, sometimes that you can capitalise on that. I mean, and it's just an interesting shot. And because it's Blackpool, and because of what we're shooting, it looks vaguely vintage. So I think it kind of matches. Mm. So. What I'd like to do is make prints yep. of the pair of them um, and then, you know, one of these days I'm going to maybe try and make a triptych out of them, go down and get a third one that I match. Ah, okay. But these two initially, um, but having never printed before, okay. I thought, yep. is, you're the man to go to for some advice. So do you reckon we can do something with these? We can indeed, yes. So this is an, this is an enlarger. Mm -hmm. An enlarger is essentially a projector. So the negative will go in there and we project we push light through it and we project it onto the baseboard. It's basically a camera in reverse. And in the same way that a camera has a lens where you can adjust the aperture, we've got aperture controls on the lens, so okay. we can increase the light or decrease the light. And we also have a timer, so we can set the, the enlarger to run for 5 seconds, 10 seconds, in exactly the same way that a camera has a shutter speed. Okay. So in a camera it works in thousandths of a second, or one yeah. thousandth of a second, or two hundred and fiftieth of a second. Here we work in whole seconds. Okay. <laughs> so so we, we tend to work about you know, 10 to 15, maybe even 20 second exposures. So the first thing that we'll do is, is we'll set the size of the image up, mm -hmm. we'll get the focus so that it's all nice and sharp, and then we'll do a test strip. And a test strip is where we put a strip of paper down and we expose part of it for, say, five seconds, yeah. then another part for five seconds. So the first parts now had 10 seconds, the new exposed parts had five, and we move the strip across so we build up a five, 10, 15, 20, 25 second set of strips. We put it through the trays and we evaluate it. We say which strip looks the best. Yeah. We come back and we set the enlarger up for that time and we make what we call a straight print. Okay. So a straight print is just the basic exposure because what we can then do is we can manipulate the print. We can give more light to some areas, mm -hmm. less light to other areas and we can build the image. So it's a very creative process. It's not just, it's not just switching on, on, that's it. No, not okay. at all. So what we're going to do first of all is we'll take the negative out of here, we'll pop it into the negative mm -hmm. carrier, and then we'll, I'll show you how to dust it, how to keep it yep. as clean as possible. Well, so if you want to well. take that out. Yep. Okay, I'll take that out of your way. So we'll pop Thank it over you. here so that it's not in the way of anything. And then you just pull the negative carrier out of there and, and sit it down here. And then the negative card, if you lift it up, it will open up. Yep. Now, what we need to do before we close it is take an anti-static brush, which is available on most, most uh, good camera shops, an anti-static brush, and we need to dust the negative on both sides. Now, I've dust it away from there, and the idea is to hold it just by the edge mm -hmm. so that you're not get any fingerprints yep. on it. So and then dust it so that the dust falls off of it. Be quite vigorous. Yeah, that's there, a very soft brush and then dust the, the glass as well. So you just pop that on there. And don't worry about lining it up too well because okay. we can adjust it once it's in okay. and then close that down. 
Great. Yeah. And then if you lift that up and just slide it into the slot there. Oh, that's okay. satisfying. And that's it in. Fantastic. We'll pop that away there. Pop that away there. Now, the, the next thing we have to do now is project the image onto the baseboard. I've already sized this masking frame for mm -hmm. a 10 by 8 sheet of paper, okay. which is a kind of a standard. But you get smaller sheets of paper, but 10 by 8 kind of, it looks impressive. It's big enough it's to, to look good, good here. Yeah. It's a good size to work with. But we have to put the light out to do that. If you open it up to fully wide, so there's maximum light. Which is already there. Excellent. And then using the hand control there, you try to focus this up. Yep, and then what we do is we use something called a focus finder, sometimes called a grain finder or a grain focuser. Different manufacturers have different names for it. And keep one hand up here mm -hmm. and tiny wee movements of yeah. that. So we'll see the and, grain. And you can see the sandy textured pattern. You're looking for a kind of a, a, a grainy texture. Oh, there it is. And when you've got that grainy texture, that's as sharp as your image will go any lack of sharpness happened in the camera. Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah. Then we pop that away and that's has got our image nice and sharp. Yep. But of course there is too much light here. So we've now got to reduce the lens down. And I would probably go one click and let's see what happens. One and another one. Yeah, I think two clicks is probably okay for this. Between two and three clicks is fine. So that's us reduced the lens. We've got the image focused up. So we need to now set the timer to a useful time. Okay. Now many people use a whole different range of times. I use five seconds. And then this big orange button here, if you press it, you'll see the timer kicks in. Okay. And the timer will switch off when it reaches zero. Okay. So it's very accurately controlling the time. So inside the paper box, if you open the, take the, the lid off. Inside, Safe. Sometimes it's a, it, for smaller amounts of packets, it's just a, a cardboard sleeve. You'll find that there's a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. So lift the plastic bag out. Now, the, I, technically the plastic bag is the light proofing, but I like to think that the cardboard box is also part of the light proofing. Yeah. So if you open the, the, the poly bag, you'll find in there large sheets, but you'll also find some smaller sheets I've cut up already. I'd just take, take, take one, one out. Take one out, yeah. Now, you just, just, just lie it down there, it'll be fine. You always fold the bag back over and you always put it back into the box. It seems a bit of a palaver to constantly be doing this, but it really is about saving your fortune at the end of the day. So position it so that an inch is available. Yeah. And then fire off the, the, the big yes. orange button. Yeah. down to zero, it'll switch off, you move it a good inch and then fire it away again. Oh, there's just something so much more satisfying about doing stuff like this than... Yeah, there is. There's plonking a card into your computer. Yeah, they, they call this kind of mindfulness now, but when I was young <laughs> they called it the zen, the, the zen, zen of photography. <laughs> and that's it. Okay, that's the test strip exposed. So now we pick it up and we move across to the sinks where we've got the chemicals. So what we have is three trays in a similar way we had to film processing with the chemicals. We've got a developer, a stop bath and a fixer. So what we have to do is put it into the developer tray first of all to develop the latent image that's in the, on the paper so we can actually see it. Development is time critical and we have worked out for our chemicals two minutes works very well but the manufacturers give you a range of times yeah. so your own practice you can develop your own your own kind of ways of working so we put it into the developer for two minutes at the end of the developer we put it into the stop bath and the developers an alkali the stop baths an acid they they neutralize each mm -hmm. other immediately so about 30 seconds in there will do nicely and then we move it into the fixer and the role of the fixer is to stabilize the image so we can put the light on and look at it two minutes in the fixer and then we move it into a wash bath for two minutes again and then we can put it through a dryer and a hot air dryer because we're using resin coated paper will dry very quickly and we have a finished product. Do you want me to put it in? Yeah, yeah, Here go for it. Yep, you might want to use your, your left hand up here and your right hand to down there. Yep. And then go over the back. <laughs> yep. And then slide in, keep this down, slide in, now lift up and get the tail end in. Fantastic. We've got the timer working. So what we're looking for is constant agitation and within 15 to 20 seconds we should see image build up and here it's coming. 
what you should have is a very light end and a very dark end yes and the right stuff in the middle mm -hmm. that's going and we have that we've got a very light end and we've got an end that's going a bit dark but it's looking like we've got the, it's still the, dark? the, the no 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 things under a red safe light look darker ah, than right, they actually are and you can sometimes be printing an image in the dark room and think it's going to be jet black and you're disappointed and you put the light on like, oh, and there's detail so in the shadows that yes. are fabulous and things so you can't really evaluate it by eye under a safe light so what we're looking for now we can see where the line of the cardboard has been yeah so we can see these increments so we can the lightest end will be the five second end mm -hmm. people often get confused yes. because they think that the end they started yes. at five seconds yep. so this is the longest exposure and this is the shortest exposure i think that's five ten and ten is just a little bit light but 15 is looking a wee bit in the dark side yeah so maybe splitting the difference so we maybe do a, a, a straight print at 12 seconds and mm -hmm. see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Now everything is, is set up, we haven't changed anything except the time or the papers there, so you just press the orange button and there we are, there's our, our, image, our image happening. And again, we're going to get wee artefacts coming at the edges there, but, but by doing a window mount, we can control what the person sees at the end of the day, and that's it. So you lift the masking frame up and you take the paper out. For me, this is certainly one of the highlights of photography, watching your precious photo magically appear before your eyes as you rock it back and forth in a tray. It would be easy to assume that this traditional way of printing is cumbersome and laborious, but if you try it, you'll realise it's anything but. It's simply a case of moving the print from one tray to another. And when the lights come back on, you get to see and hold your print, which has come to life using nothing but light. It's then just a case of drying the print before it's a finished product. So, I'm quite happy with these actually. Yeah, how do you feel about slower photography? <laughs> I like it a lot. I was, I was just saying to somebody earlier, it forces you to wait for things like we've got a seagull in this shot, which, you know, you could have photoshopped in, but mm. I, I had to stand there and wait for a couple minutes for it to come yeah. into the right place. So I love it. And I love actually, th the light seems to work, the, the light leaks that we've got, which, Yeah, these you know, serendipitous moments, you take advantage yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. I once had a camera which um, wouldn't ro wind on properly, so I got lots of overlapping images. Oh, and I was really disappointed until I realised that that was an amazing set yeah. of abstract images. Mm -hmm. So I printed this long strip. You, you can gorgeous. make your, your yeah. mistakes yeah. work. Your for mistakes you. can, can really add to things. I, yeah. think, um, I think I need a third one, actually, uh -huh. because two, I like the idea of having three on a wall. And okay. I think from when we were down the first time in Blackpool, these are the only two with the light leaks, which obviously I didn't know at the time. Yeah. So I'm f I don't know if I can replicate it, probably not, but I might get back down at some stage and get a third one. Well, you wouldn't uh, have to replicate that. the light leaks because what we can do is, is we can put your hand in ah. and you can blur the edges so that it's not getting as much light. Well, I love the fact that the creative process does not end when no. you're out on location doing it. You can actually carry it on into, into a dark room. What would you say to people who are maybe watching, um, who are maybe, their interest has been piqued by this? And uh, Well, the, 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 the great thing is that this method, the traditional method of, um, of negatives and printing in a dark room, hasn't died out at all. It's vibrant across the world. There are communities everywhere who are doing it. There are community darkrooms all across the UK, community darkrooms all across Europe. And I don't know about other places like America and things like that, but I'd imagine that they're just as strong there. So there are places being run by uh, volunteers all over the world who are very keen to keep the whole process going. So you'll, you'll, you'll be able to hook up with people who would show you the ropes. Absolutely. And of course, the other thing about it is it's, it, it's learning by dabbling. Mm. You, you have a go, you learn by your mistakes. One of our members says that he's not learning unless the bin is full. <laughs> it's a really, really nice idea. I like so the, way of so it, yeah. the more mistakes you make, the more you're learning. Yeah, true. And, and also, it's, um, because it takes a long time, it's a kind of slow photography, then you get into that moment. You appreciate the moment. And as you say, with waiting for the, the bird to fly into the shot, you become uh, more selective more considered mm -hmm. and I think your photography improves rather than taking uh, you know 25 burst shots on your, your, your digital mm. image. There's time for it to soak in mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. and obviously if anybody is in the north of Scotland. Oh please visit the Inverness Darkroom. The Inverness Community Darkroom is here and we'd, we're delighted to have visitors. Fantastic well thanks so much. No it's been my pleasure.
I really enjoyed the hands-on approach to printing photos that I'd taken, so much so I think just as much creativity is required to print in the darkroom as taking a photo in the first place. It's certainly way more fun than inserting a memory card into a computer and adjusting some sliders, at least I think so. If you enjoy the process of photography and have a community darkroom in your area, then dust off that old film camera, buy a roll of black and white film and discover a whole new world of creativity which goes way beyond the capture stage. It's a great opportunity to use any poor weather days, not that we have any of those here on the west coast of Scotland of course. A big thank you to Matt at the Inverness Darkroom for showing me the ropes and being so patient. Okay well at the start of the show I asked which of these combinations would give the greatest magnification when viewed at 100% on a computer. A. A 200mm lens on a full frame camera. B. A 200mm lens on a micro four thirds camera. C. A 200mm lens on an APS crop sensor camera. Or D. It makes no difference as it's to do with the pixel density and not the sensor size. The correct answer was D. A common misconception in photography is that smaller sensors provide a greater magnification at a given focal length, but this would only be true if the pixel density was the same on all sensors. For example, a 200mm lens would give a greater enlargement when viewed at 100% if used on a 50 megapixel full frame camera than it would on a 20 megapixel micro four thirds. Well done if you got that one right. So sadly we're out of time, but don't go before I get a chance to tell you what you can look forward to on the next show. We'll be showing you when you need to use a tripod and updating an old rule of thumb when it comes to hand holding a camera. We'll be looking at shooting cine film in a 35mm camera and asking the time old question, does having better gear make you a better photographer because personally I'll take all the help I can get. That is all coming up in just a couple of weeks so make sure you join me for that. Until then, take good care but most of all, take good photos. I also need to make sure I don't move my camera side to side. Side to side to side. side. It always gives you something to hope for, something to get out of bed for. What a load of rubbish that was. Not bad for half the price, but here's the crucial question. Third question, stop saying that, it's not even in the script. To tell us how to avoid unintentional camera moment. <laughs> but most importantly with all, as with, uh, as with all photography, but most importantly of all, as with all photography, but most importantly with all... ...be like as long as it's white or grey. But we do have a limited supply of these blue ones, which is our lovely... I'm trying to do it and read it at the same time, which doesn't work. It makes no difference, as it's not to do with the density of the density of the density. Dang it.